Yeah, I love it. Woohoo! Anybody have any money left? Uh, no. No. <laughs> You notice how addicting it is to just keep going back to that little ATM and then all of a sudden it's just pull out those credit cards and everything. By the time you leave, you cannot believe how much you spent. There goes your vacation for the year, okay? your wife's new ring or something, the wedding that you wish you had given her. <laughs> One she's pissed off that she didn't get. Um, Anyway, how many, uh, just to uh, get a, an idea, how many people here were fans of the original show? Okay. How many were fans of the new show? How many fans uh, go both ways? <laughs> <laughs> Trick question. Oh, I, would, I wouldn't commit yourself to, okay. So, I have to be honest with you, I, I love both shows for different I tell people, you know, there's not enough quality sites to plot on the air. And uh, so, the new Battle Star, which I thought was going to be a cheesy 90210 kind of rip-off by the, uh, of the original. And unfortunately, when they bring back classics, they usually screw them up. Mm -hmm. So I just thought it was going to be this cheesy little thing. I had no idea if it was going to be so well written, so well acted, so well. What I can tell you is that I have written all kinds of letters and articles and the fact that networks and studios don't listen to sci-fi fans. And so I uh, kind of, there started to be this big revolution. I mean, there were so many battles that were pissed off and angry. And poor Ron Moore was producing the new Battle series. He was getting all these scathing letters. And uh, it got really, really nasty. And I happened to produce the 25th Battlestar Anniversary Commission. I had also gotten the BattlestarGalactica.com domain because Universal never even got it. So, you know, here I was, trying to promote Battlestar, trying to bring it back. And I had been going to the studio, to the networks, to all these companies trying to promote a revival of Battlestar Galactica. I ultimately created this trailer called the Second Coming trailer, which uh, back in the day, nobody made trailers. Everybody laughed at me. Everybody thought I was crazy. By the way, if you ever want to do something and people think you're crazy, know you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. Most people don't see the force of the trees. Thank God some of the great visionary, right, in history are the ones who didn't give up. And that's how technology evolved. That's how all the new innovations in the world evolved because people didn't give up. Because most people were either terrified, scared, or didn't believe. Anyway, the point is, I did this trailer that started out as an animated storyboard because I had pitched Bringing Back Battlestar to the studio and they couldn't even remember Battlestar. They didn't even know they still owned it. And then I said, you know, I need to show them something more visual. So I was going to do an animated storyboard. Storyboard is like comic book, only with music, um, dialogue. So it's kind of a little bit like a sizzle reel um, these days. And comic books have gone in that direction, right? Um, so anyway, it started out like that, and then it evolved into this trailer, like a movie trailer. And I had all these people come on board, people that honestly were big Battlestar fans, but now they were big in the industry. Volker, Volker Ingo was the uh, special effects supervisor for ID4, right? Won an Academy Award for that. Uh, Dean Cundy, our DP, was uh, the DP for Jurassic Park and Apollo 13. He came on board free with a camera, 35 millimeter camera. 35mm uh, film, and worked for a whole day for a full hammer. And I had all these people helping us out, and we didn't have much of a budget, although I must say my poor little credit card was ka-chinging, ka-chinging, ka -chinging, and little amounts add up to big amounts. And by the time we finished, it was a lot more money than I ever expected. But, uh, but we got it done, and we did it for an exceptionally small amount of money. If you haven't seen it, you should go on YouTube. Put in the second coming trailer, you'll find it. That'll start a second coming trailer. Um, I, uh, I then produced, like I said, the 25th Battlestar Anniversary Convention, and I invited, I decided, okay, Universal could not get it. I played the trailer at the Comic-Con, at Dragon-Con, we had a huge audience, everybody was blown away, I couldn't believe how excited everybody was. Uh, Miramax, Harvey Weinstein, a big distribution company that produces all these big movies, they wanted to make a deal, thinking I must own it, if I made a trailer. And if I made a trailer, there must be a movie. <coughs> Nobody made trailers without a movie back then. And so we were kind of ahead of the curve. And uh, I couldn't even to return the phone call. 
I thought, I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> the university is going to say, he doesn't have a license. What are you doing making this, you know? So uh, I wasn't making it to make money off of it. I was making it to, to inspire a revival and get everybody excited and show them what was possible. Um, eventually, I hosted the 25th anniversary, and I finally, after kind of going through the heartache of feeling like Universal just was not open to doing anything with Battlestar, I invited all the people associated with Battlestar, Glenn Larson. Um, and then I had heard about this new rendition of Battlestar being proposed over the sci fi channel. And uh, Tom DeSanto and Brian Singer, who were the producers of X Men, the movie, they were interested in doing Battlestar, and they were interested in doing a continuation of some of the original stars like me, and Dirk Kennedy, and some of the others. But Sci Fi Channel didn't want them. They were not interested in the original show. So eventually, they hired somebody, or Ron Moore came in, I'm not sure which. I didn't know Ron Moore at the time, but he proposed a reimagining. So they filmed a pilot. And he brought over. I invited him to come as well. I invited everybody to come to the convention to propose to the fans what they were doing. Let the fans make up their own mind. And uh, the interesting thing was is that when Ron Moore got up to show his new trailers, it was so dramatically different than the original that you have never been in such a cold, frozen group. Okay? Um, I couldn't believe at the beginning of this panel that fans were bringing in big bags of popcorn. I didn't know what that was for. And then somebody told me that Ron Moore got so upset with all the criticism and all the negative feedback from the fans, who weren't open to something new, that he said, look, if you don't like it, and this was kind of an aside, you know, coming out of frustration, if you don't like it, throw popcorn. Well, <laughs> you should never have said that because they were bringing in these big bags of popcorn. <laughs> and that's when I went, oh my God, they're going to pelt Ron Moore with popcorn. And I, I was really, and, and after he played the trailers, which was so different than the original because in space there's no sound. So in movies we put sound in space and make it right for metal. We took out the sound in space. And then he didn't, you couldn't hear the ships going silent. And then he put in drum, drumming, which was, again, so different. By the way, I love it now, but then it was so shockingly different. So I basically uh, got up after the trailer because it was a cold, frozen, angry, pissed off room. And I got up and I said, you know, I said, I don't know what this series is going to be like. I was afraid it was going to be like a 90210, cheesy little ripoff. But I said, the one, I have to tell you that obviously this is a much different Battlestar than I was envisioning. And so I'm not sure how I feel about this. But I said, one thing I knew was this was being made by somebody who was visionary, who was gifted and talented. And therefore, I was open to seeing what was going to happen. Right? So after that, I think Ron Moore realized I wasn't a horrible, bad guy. And uh, he always tells a story sometimes when he talks about what happened back then. And he says, uh, yeah, after I played my trailers, it was a cold, frozen, angry room. And then Moses stood up <laughs> and parted the waters, you know. It's very funny. Um, I wasn't there when he said that. But anyway, so uh, I met him afterwards up in the green room. And I talked to him and his wife. And we had a really nice conversation, and uh, he actually told me that uh, he may contact me in a few months and wanted to talk, and said if the show, when I finally talked to him online, he said if the show gets picked up, and at that time there was no guarantee of getting picked up, uh, it was going to be a mini-series and that's it. And he said, if it gets picked up, would you be interested in maybe coming on board for something? And I said, I, 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 I'm open. To talk, and so that was the smartest thing I ever said. And three or four months later, he called me up and said, "Well, the show got picked up, and it played in Europe first on the Sky Channel because they put in half the money actually to actually produce the first season of Battlestar." And so I came in to meet the producers and everybody, and um, actually some of the writers. I was really blown away because I had gone to acting school with them, you know, some 10, 20 years earlier. In fact, one of them dated my wife which was really quite 
I don't know if that was a sign from the gods, I don't know. Uh, but nevertheless, I basically uh, had a great meeting with Ron and he proposed me doing this political revolutionary a la Nelson Mandela, Tom Zeriker. He said it's a one episode shot, but it could turn into more. So, I said yes. I went up to Vancouver and I, on the third episode, I got to film with all the actors. I met Jamie Bamber playing Captain Paul. And I just, I just found, it's actually on my iPhone, I just found this whole little sequence with interviews with Jamie Bamber and the producers and me, all about me coming on the show, which I'd never seen before. Isn't that funny? Talking about how, how he wasn't sure that was a good idea to have a call come on. And, you know, he felt threatened and a little bit intimidated meeting me. But uh, finally when I met, and we had this really incredible day of shooting the first day, and we got along with things. I mean, I really love Jamie and I love his family. I thought he made a great Apollo. And uh, I was more than happy to be up there playing Tom Zarek, seriously. I, I loved Apollo, but I was frustrated as an actor with Apollo. Because I always felt, why does never know what to do with the good guy? The same way women don't know what to do with the good guy. They like the bad guy. The screwed up guy. Cut off. By the time they get around to us good guys, okay? It's, it's... Anyway, writers never knew what to do with Paul. Back up. So I, I was frustrated. I didn't feel like I was getting any meaningful material. And I, I even felt with a new Paula in the new show that even though he certainly got a lot more to do than I did, that was interesting. I, they kept switching him around from Viper Pilot and politics and this and that. I felt like they never quite knew what to do with that Apollo either. You know, and, and so that had to be a little frustrating. So anyway, the point is is that I uh, I pitched all this and I came on the show and it was life changing. It was one of the best experiences of my life. Working with Edward Almer, working with uh, Mary McDonald, uh, who doesn't remember her from Dances with Wolves. I had a crush on her, like maybe a few of them. Um, and, and then James Callis and all this whole slew of really talented people doing it. So I got to be over there for four years, almost five years, and all the way to the end, until about halfway through the final season. And I won't, if you haven't watched it yet, I won't tell you what happens in the final season. The same way I wish nobody had told me what happened in the final episode of Game of Thrones. I was so pissed off! I hate it when they kill people you love. Don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Although I saw the Red Witch. <laughs> there could be miracles happening. Who knows? I know. I haven't read the book, so I don't know what happens. But anyway, the point of it is, is that... Uh, so, I got to be on the show, and best experience of my life. And I'm going to play this XNAR thing, because uh, I have a DVD to actually play Battlestar stuff, but I think they only play... They can only play a digital stick. Uh, with a stick, and all I have is this this new thing that I'm, part, I'm involved in, too. How many Star Trek fans are you? Okay, well... Uh, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, an original Star Trek fan, and I also love starting to like Next Generation and all the other shows, but I've always been a huge Star Wars. I'm a big sci-fi fan. Okay, we'll so, um, but, you, as you know, they're making these Star Trek fan films, right? The series that are on the, on the air. And uh, James Colley started doing it 15 years ago, and they started out pretty rudimentary, and now they're growing and getting better and better and having professionals come on, and they've gotten much more skillful, and I, I actually got invited to New Voyage's set to play a real bad guy, and my friend was directing it, and he asked me if I would do it, and I didn't know what to expect. I thought it might be like four people in a hand, and a little <laughs> iPhone, you know, seriously, and I showed up and I discovered all these, the original sets from Desert Studios had been recreated in detail. It's actually partly a museum as well. I had never seen anything so well done. They have a new DP and a nice red epic camera that they're filming with and top of the line everything. I was blown away by the team. They had a hundred man team, which is made up of fans who are technicians or good at electric, you know, uh, uh, technical things. They all come to support it once or twice a year. So I just finished filming that. And then this new thing, which is really the biggest thing I've ever seen. I think because the networks and studios don't support sci-fi all the time, they really don't. And we're kind of hungry for, you know, there's not even a Star Trek series on. Okay? There's, there's no Fireflies going on, Babylon 5, Farscape, Battlestar, they're all off! Which is so stupid. But studios just don't get it. So now fans, especially fans who are talented, gifted uh, filmmakers, are getting together to join in and actually creating product, right, for the fans. 
And of course, at this point, the, the studios have allowed it, as long as you don't sell it, and you can't make money off it. But now you have millions of fans watching. So I think the day is coming when there may be revenue sharing and licensing by the studios and allow these productions to go to the next level. And let these people actually produce, right, the kind of product that we sci-fi fans want to see. Well, this x nar thing is the next quantum leap in what used to be a fan film is now evolving into a Star Trek indie film. It's not a series, it's an indie film. They have raised over a million dollars, one of the highest, uh, most successful indie Kickstarter, which is Kickstarter is where fans like all of us can donate 50 bucks, 100 bucks. If you donate more, there's all these perks, t-shirts, this, that, but then you can get perks like a day on the set. You can even get to be a production assistant. You can even get a non-speaking role. Um, and you could get a producer credit if you uh, donated enough money. But it's a new way of funding projects, new kinds of ideas, new companies. So they've raised a million. It's called Exonog. Um, they have created a little 20 minute intro into the world, which was just going to be a little interview thing. And then they decided to have a some costume actually being the characters five years after the war. The war actually takes place in Star Trek canon. That means uh, while Kirk was in Starfleet Academy, okay, uh, he looked up to this Starfleet captain named Garth of Izar. And Garth of Izar was best known for the War of Exenar, for the Battle of Exenar. Well, this goes into the four-year War of Exenar. It's never been explored by the studios or anybody else. And they brought in this whole slew of really gifted, talented, well-known actors like uh, Kate Vernon from the new Battlestar, um, uh, Tony Todd from Candyman, um, the Rock, so many other movies. J.G. Herzler, who is one of the quintessential Klingons in the Star Trek universe. Uh, Gary Graham, who plays Sobot, the same role that he's played on Star Trek, and a whole slew of other wonderful professionals, both, both before and, and half, half behind the camera. So I'm going to play you a thing from this. Let you take a glimpse of this, and then if you want, go on YouTube, check out the website, you can see what they're doing. But right now, they're doing one last, I think they might have finished the Kickstarter, um, and to raise additional funds, because these projects take a lot of money, but what's so nice, they're demonstrating that you can create a studio quality, sci-fi, action, adventure, powerful story for a lot less money than the studios spend. Seriously, studios make you believe that you need hundreds of millions of dollars. You don't. So much of that money is wasted, you have no idea. And I hate to say it, so much of the money never goes in the hands of the people who do the most work. This new business model, I think, makes the uh, filmmakers more accountable, uh, the money is used more wisely, and the people who actually create the product might have the chance of actually reaping the biggest benefits, which is what they should, don't you think? Mm -hmm. And then it should be a win-win between the fans, just like iTunes. iTunes changed the whole music industry so that we stopped getting gouged, and we started paying far less money for music, and the studio actually ended up making more money because they reached deeper into the marketplace and reached more people who couldn't buy it before. So it was a win-win, right? So I think this new kind of thing that we're developing now, where you're going to see movies and television series on the web, and the web is going to be extended to your whatever device you've got, your phone, your iPad, your this or that. This is the way we watch shows now. And it doesn't matter where you are, or you can watch it on the television set. But this whole new independent alternate track of programming is really kicking into high gear. And a lot of indie young people are developing new series and new networks. All kinds of interesting things are happening. So it's an exciting day to be in the entertainment industry. And you don't have to be in Hollywood, okay, to make something good. So I don't know if this is going to sound very good on this thing. I really don't. I hate it. Because it sounds so important on trailers. But we'll see if this remotely is decent. So let's just try it. Be sure the sound is up high, uh, but not to the distortion uh, level. Because uh, through speakers, which is not meant for playing movie trailers, you know, it may not. Come together as a, as a group of human beings with diverse beliefs, bias, and prejudice, having to somehow work through all of that crap. Can we come to a place where we start to respect each other? start to learn how to get along, right? Which is what we're struggling with in this country, right? So my thought of it was that 
I didn't want to be part of a battle star that wasn't battle star. So I turned it down. Yeah. Yeah, talks about maybe a rebooting for a movie. I know a lot of series are done in the movies. Well, they're not rebooting, but uh, Brian Singer uh, is has been working on, they made a deal at Universal to do a Battlestar movie based on the original. But I think it's a reimagining of the original again. And I don't know what, see, my problem is, they've already explored it twice. What new territory are they going to bring? They're going to go back and start it from the beginning again? I, I don't think that works. And my thought of it was is that what they should do is explore the original series 30 years later so that we go into story terrain that's never been explored before. And you could actually have a bridge with some of the original characters like what, like they were going to do, building off to the next generation. And that's actually what I write in my books. My, all my Battlestar books are about the original actors 30 years later with a new generation born in space. So again, I think that would be the smartest move, but I don't know what they're going to do. I do know that they were struggling because Glenn Larson was still alive, had the movie rights, and I think he was trying to write the script, and I don't think Brian was necessarily happy with that. I think Brian wanted to bring in his own writer. I don't blame him. Uh, Glenn's a great producer, but I think that, you know, that he was probably very controlling about his story, and I don't blame him, it's his story, but you know, if you're going to bring in another creative force like a Brian Singer, you got to collaborate, right? you got to open up and find common ground and collaborate and allow Battlestar to not just be frozen in the past, but it's got to, it's got to grow. you got to keep all the things that we love about it, but you got to allow it to, to grow to the next, next level. And I think uh, Glenn passed away this past year, and I don't know if the movie rights reverted to Universal or to the family, but I do hear that the script have, has been developed that has gotten approval. So you may very well be hearing shortly that, that it's gone into production, but I don't know what it's about. I'm hoping to meet with uh, a good friend of mine who's involved in that whole thing to kind of get an update. So we, we shall see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Have you talked to like Dirk Benedict or any other actor? Oh, yeah, I see, about, see, like, we see each other all the time. Well, I mean, about, like, if you, there's a new movie about them also being involved in it or. Yeah, but I don't think we're even thinking about that because if it's reimagined, it's probably going to be all new actors. But they may bring some of us in for, they may want us for cameos, but I'm not one for cameos. Uh, I always feel like a cameo is like saying, we'd like to use your name, but we don't give a crap about your actor. You know, we're going to give you like five seconds of lines and show you for two seconds and then that's it. My thought is, if I don't have to play Apollo, but if I could play that interesting character that was worth playing, I would love it. I would do that. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the doors are open. Who knows what's going to happen and what they're going to finally come up with. Maybe if they see the success of Star Wars, somebody will go, it might be smart to bring the original actress back and let this be a bridge. I don't know. Maybe they will. That would be a great idea, I think. Yeah. Oh. Well, I, you never saw Capricorn. No. Caprica uh, was a totally different style of Galactica. I think that was one of the downfalls of it. Uh, they changed it so drastically from the style of the new reimagined version. But Caprica went into how the sound was. Trouble was, it got canceled way too soon. Uh, I would have liked to have seen the. See, it started with human beings who were having kind of a religious war between monotheists and polytheists. That means those who believe in one God, those who believe in multiple gods. And unfortunately, that got programmed into this new Cylon technology that was meant to serve humanity. But ultimately, out of this battling, it would have grown into terrorism and horrible fights, like the Muslims and the Christian extremists battling each other, right? Going back to, you know, um, Israel and all the wars and battles that took place there between the Christians and the Muslims, right? It was kind of a metaphor for that. And then ultimately it gets, it gets reprogrammed into the Cylons, and ultimately, we didn't get that far, but uh, the Cylons, uh, like all creations, rebelled against their masters, their creators, and basically find their own evolutionary line. Uh, so, but we never got that far. So it would have been interesting to, to have had at least one more year of Caprica so we could have seen that. But if you want to see a little bit of the formulation of that, go watch Caprica. Yeah. yeah.
Would you, uh, is, and maybe you already answered this, but is that Balasar Galactic Area Imaging Universe done? Or are they, is there any other projects coming out of that? I don't know. That um, I, see, for me, I think Battlestar always goes off too soon. Um, I feel like there's so much more story to, to explore. Um, but, like I said, networks and studios, for whatever reasons, I hate to say this, but certain shows appeal to a larger segment of humanity, and they tend to be a little less provocative, a little bit more benign, a little less confrontive, a little less edgy, right? But something that's deeper, darker, more edgy, has a very dedicated audience, but studios don't necessarily stay with some of those kinds of shows very long. They really don't. Um, the original Battlestar was kind of different because we were more family oriented. So we kind of had a much larger audience. I mean, when you think about it, we had 65 million people watching the premiere episode of Battlestar. A top rated show on TV today would be lucky to have 15 to 20 million. Yeah, it goes to show you how the topography of uh, ratings and television has changed. Yeah. Anybody else? Another question? Yeah. Yeah. She got in trouble watching that. Uh, I got, I think I was always watching these sci-fi because I was always watching every house every year. I was always a kid. Um, but what I see in sci-fi is that it deals with the world issues, you know, this racist different. You know, and we combine that in sci-fi that we get to have a discussion about the rise of power and the change of the you know, things like that. And at the ball, if you look at a guy that's going to talk about that, I'm going to look at it, we've had these struggles since the world started, and you know, you see balls, and you know, we've got a lot of sort of and all the sci-fi movies, the evolution of the change and the fear that the normal society has. And that's what I've always been attracted to with those Yeah, the, uh, the, the thing about Battlestar was that it always kind of mirrored society, right? Uh, great science fiction is visionary. And it's intelligent. It has something to say about the world. It has something to say about a human being. That's why I love it. I mean, look, to each their own, but I do. Sean Penn once said, movies are too important to be just about entertainment. They've got to be about something. Show me an insight. Show me a part of humanity. Show me something I don't see every five minutes. Have a point of view. Have a vision, right? If you just show me what I've seen four billion times again, which is one reason why I get so bored watching so many movies. It's just, the minute they get into the action sequences, I've seen it four billion times. Same old, same old, same old, same old. I'm looking for strong characters that are motivated and let the action come out of the characters, let it come out. But so often it's just a bunch of fireworks, right? And the, if you ever notice the action sequences used to be a lot shorter, now they go on and on and on and on and on and on forever. And for me, I just turn it off because after a while, I, I don't care. It doesn't move me, it doesn't do anything for me. There are too many Michael Rennies left. Oh, Michael Rennies, so yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. The day that Earth stood still was a great movie. I love that movie. But I got to do say that Battlestar, the new Battlestar, mirrored society. What, how would we human beings deal with post-apocalyptic, post-9/11 type circumstances? And we got to see it. We got to see how easy democracy can be lost, how difficult it is for people because people end up crossing the line, breaking the rules, and doing very bad things in order to accomplish good things. But that, in a sense, very rarely, I mean, do we find that kind of line between good and bad. You realize that all of us, and people that go to war, been in war, know that the best of us can fall. The best of us can end up doing hideous things that we can't live with for the rest of our lives. Many of us struggle with this after we've been through war. Because you lose a sense of your own integrity, your own sense of your own humanness, and you find yourself doing horrendous things that you never thought you were capable of. Battlestar kind of opened up a lot of doors to all of that. And when people come up and go, oh, because said you're doing the bad guy. They go, what bad guy? I said, why am I the bad guy? Did I destroy democracy? Did I turn, you know, government into a dictatorship? Did I rig elections? Uh, did I throw people in jail that didn't agree? 
I, I want to know who the good guy and the bad guys are. And the truth of it is, I don't know if you watch Braveheart, which is one of my favorite movies. Uh, freedom! <laughs> no, um, uh, history is written by the winners, right? And uh, as we saw in Battlestar, that there was a lot of in and out and in betweens where good people did a lot of really bad stuff. So, like I said, I, uh, I love playing characters that are conflicted, morally conflicted, and when you're in a life and death circumstance, you will be morally conflicted between the part of you that you think would rise up and be the hero, turns out to be the coward, or turns out to be very manipulative, or you'll do whatever, right, to save your life, as opposed to maybe helping somebody else. Or you might find out that you are the hero, and you never suspected you had that in you. Or you might be the hero one day and the coward the next day, and you have to live on both sides of the equation. The truth is, that's what you discover in a great, really powerful drama, like Battlestar Galactic. Battlestar Hell, that's why I love it so much. Another question, guys? Yeah. Could you just clarify for me, like, the, the original show wasn't canceled for ratings, right? It was canceled for The original show was canceled because, number one, it was on ABC. ABC, <laughs> <laughs> ABC had seven out of the top ten shows. And so, therefore, when the show that cost as much as this show cost dropped out of the top ten, they were arrogant about why should we keep on a show this expensive, right? Um, like I said, CBS or NBC, whoever had Buck Rogers, Buck Rogers was 30 percentage points below us. And they were on another network and they stayed on for three years because they didn't have all the top ten shows like ABC did. Two, networks didn't get sci-fi to begin with. They wanted, they didn't even want Battlestar to be a series. In fact, it was supposed to be a mini-series, seven hours long. It only got picked up as a series a few episodes into the seven-hour miniseries. It got picked up as a full season without time to actually develop the story arcs. So it was rushed. And unfortunately, because it was rushed, it took a lot longer to film it, to get the scripts written, and we ended up having 10, 12-day episodes that cost a fortune. It would have cost a lot less money had we had enough lead time to develop it correctly. They made a million mistakes. And the last thing they should have done is kept it on um, and done uh, movies, because the movie that went out was really successful. They could have made a series of movies, and the merchandising alone would have made them a fortune. But they didn't get any of it. They just didn't understand. Same way 20th didn't understand with George Lucas, when George Lucas said, I'll give you the movie rights. You get the profit off of the movie, and I'll just take the merchandising rights. <laughs> and 20th said, what an idiot, you know, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and they had no clue what they were doing, you know, he made a billion dollar fortune off of the merchandise, right, yeah, so, I know, I know, another question guys, to me about anything, yeah, yeah, um, no, I love Tom Zarek, one of my favorite characters in the new BSG. All right, give um, him his money back, please. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, and you'll have an annuity, okay? All Every right. Month, we'll send you a hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to know, um, well, what was it like being and creating Tom Zarek and being in Tom Zarek's head? Well, I have to be honest with you, I'm very political, okay? I'm political in the sense that I am always curious to see how the political process works, to wonder why people vote the way they vote, and to understand people's motivation. My problem is that I don't care whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or Libertarian, I don't care where you are. The point of it is most people explain what they believe in through sound bites. They, they don't even know what they're voting for. Because most people, we get through the day, right? We pay our bills, we struggle, we're tired. We don't have time. And yet government, the Constitution is of the people, by the people, for the people. And if we don't make our government accountable, and if we don't vote from an informed, educated position, we end up with a bunch of idiots in government. And then we shut our eyes and wonder why everything goes south. And everything happens the way it happens, right? Because we're, it's not government that's the blame, it's we, the people. We allowed it. We're allowing it. We brought those people in there. 
so whether it's Republicans, Democrats, it seems to me they end up to be the same. Same problems, same issues. They go, yeah, we believe in less regulations. Yeah, but we want more regulations. Nobody enforces the regulations, no matter how many regulations you have. And my only thing that I care about is I want a fair playing field where everybody has an equal opportunity to succeed. It's not about taking care of people. It's about empowering, educating, and getting everybody out there being productive, right? But we don't have a good educational system. We, it's so expensive, it's impossible for people, and the educational system doesn't even do the job it's supposed to and prepare people for life. I mean, I, I, across the board, I have a million things that piss me off. But then I see people voting against their self-interest. Because people who know how to manipulate people put the fear of God. Like, it's so easy to tell you, hey, you know Tom down the block? He's a pedophile. I know it, I've seen it, I've heard it. Maybe they never saw it, but they, somebody else told them, somebody else told them. And then, you don't do any research. You think he's a pedophile because someone's just angry at Tom down the block and he's called him a pedophile. Yeah. And now everybody has a doubt and fear about Tom, right? That's how easy it is to put the fear of God in someone's head. And government and politics, they put the fear of God. If you vote for this person, if you vote for this legislation, the world's going to end. And you don't know any better, and you just pull back. People, if we're not educated and informed, we're easily manipulated through fear. Whether it's Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, it doesn't matter who it is. So my only thought of it is, the vast majority of us probably agree on far more than we disagree on. And yet the extreme platforms of both parties, right? What do they do? They focus on what we don't agree on, right? And they create what we call a very partisan, adversarial relationship where nothing gets done. So we lose. And the middle, which is the largest group of us, whether you're middle left, middle right, we're in the middle, we're passive. We don't speak up. We don't do anything. We hardly vote. It's the extreme platforms that get all the noise and make all the, right? So we're at the mercy of all of that. That's, it just keeps going back to the fact that what the original framers of the Constitution said, which was, you don't have a democracy unless it's out the people, by the people, for the people, and the trouble is we don't have it. So therefore, governments get away with murder. The same way corporations get away with murder. And everybody plays by a different set of rules. And everybody wonders why they're pissed off and angry and frustrated. You know, I don't know about you, if you want to see a football game, and the rules were different for both sides of the team, they, 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 over here, they, they get five downs instead of four. You know, this person only has to get to midfield to have a touchdown. <laughs> I mean, how would you feel about watching that game? Well, that's how the game is played in life. That's how we play the game. So all I want is fairness. All I want is integrity. And uh, by the way, if I think we had a great educational system and, a great me and we don't have a great medical thing, I don't want to compare it to other places. I just want to say that I've had too many people involved in the medical system, and unfortunately, it's not a preventative care system. And I don't know about you, but when it's such a money-driven system of drugs and things, do you think psychologically anybody really wants to come up with a antidote that might stop you from getting cancer or might right solve a problem? I mean, a good person would say, of course I don't want people to have cancer. But you know what? If people really took care of themselves and didn't need to go to hospitals and, and, and take care of all that stuff because they actually had preventative care, then the medical system would not be generating the zillions of dollars it does. All the old people are hooked on drugs, on medications, on, on, on painkillers. It's, it, I go into my mother's dementia home. They're all drugged. Yeah. Uh, they're all out of it. And I go, what is this all about? That way we don't, it's just so much easier to take care of, right? And I got a person who was just getting on drugs. It, she OD, go in the hospital, they put her on more drugs, and she comes home addicted to those drugs. I mean, all I'm telling you is that for me, there's a lot of, so it's, let me just say that I identify with Tom Zarek. I was, everything that happened to Tom Zarek pissed me off as Richard Hatch. Why? 
And by the way, people just don't get this, but Ron Moore told the writers to always put the truth in Tom Terry's mouth. Cool. And even Jamie Bammer's character, Apollo, at the end, when they're going to arrest me on the bridge, he goes, you know, if you get past his arrogance, and it wasn't arrogance, it was being pissed off at a system that's unfair. A system that, that I hate to say it, through history, you know how many good people have been relegated to be the bad guy in history because of the government? If you challenge government or religious authority back then, remember religion and government worked together back in eons past. Okay? It was a way of controlling the people. And if you were against anybody, if you believed differently, if you challenged government or, or whatever the, the, the church was at that time, well, guess what happened to you? That's right. And you were relegated to this hidden, hideous, horrible creature. So good people and bad people, and the so-called good people were not the good people. So in a lot of ways, good, but really bad people who do bad things really good at camouflaging themselves to be good guys. It's really true. So the question is, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? And I would have to say, it's a lot of confusion now. And we don't know. But we form a lot of judgments that I form myopic that are not based on truth. So again, I have a lot of issues like that. And like I said, the Tom Zare character kind of touched me on a, profound, on a really deep, profound level because I thought, you know, what gave you the right to throw people in jail who don't agree with you? Your job in a democracy is to build consensus. Not to disrespect the Congress. Okay? You're not God. You don't have the right to make decisions for all of them. That's why we have a democracy. But, so guess what? They were throwing people in jail who didn't agree with them. They read the election because they thought they know who should be governing. Right? All kinds of crazy stuff, and yet, who's the bad guy? I'm the bad guy. Why am I the bad guy? Because Adama and Rosalind said I'm the bad guy. If you really think about it, they did as many bad things or more than everything they accused me of. So my thought was, it's easy, and I only use that as an example, because we all buy into bias, prejudice, and listening to sound bites that will drift us over and make a point of view against somebody that may be wonderful, may be right, but now we don't trust them. That's why in this society where it's so easy to undermine, attack somebody, right? You can go online digitally and go after somebody, and you don't know what's true anymore. And you have the trouble with most of this. Somebody hears it, they tweet it from somebody else, and all of a sudden this whole message goes out because somebody's pissed off and angry at you and it has nothing to do with truth. So my only thought is, I've kind of learned to be a lot more what I find Jesus to have really said about forgiveness, you know? I'm so much more empathetic and forgiving of people because I realize that we're very human. We're very fracked up humans capable of making huge mistakes. We're all capable of going to the dark side and to the right stressful situations. Good people have done horrible things, okay? And they may never do, that's another reason why I'm not for a, I'm not for our, our penal system. Why do I want to spend my money putting what may be a very good person who made one mistake in their life in jail and now they come up, come out a criminal because they're so angry and pissed off at the system and they've been so fracked up while they were in there, right? All I'm doing now is paying to make worse people. Well, so it's a punishment system and not a rehabilitation system. So why do I want to put my money into that? It only creates more crime. I want to get rid of crime. I want to create a safer world, right? In a world, like I said, it's not about taking care of people. It's about empowering people, educating people, getting people who wants to be taken care of anyway. Everybody I know wants a job that, that utilizes their talents and abilities to make a wage that can pay and have a decent life. We all want that. Unfortunately, a lot of us don't get that opportunity or chance. We're way behind the eight ball. You know? And I hate that thought of, well, I sucked it up. No, you didn't suck it up. You never had the challenges that this person over here was born with. You know? So my thought of it is, anyway, I just think quality education should be available to everybody. I don't care what your economic background is. Everybody should have the very best of education. And then you have an equal opportunity to go out there and succeed. Right? 
But that's threatening to a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to have fair competition. It terrifies them. If everybody had an equal opportunity to succeed, boy, I may not be able to get what I got, you know. You know. But my thought of it is it's a far more exciting football game when everybody plays by the same set of rules, right? So you opened up a bag of tricks there. I'm sure you wish, like, Jesus, why did I ask that question about Tom Zarek? <laughs> oh, my God. That's been my God. favorite part so far. I know. Uh, Any more last question, Andrew, before we finish? And I'm sorry we didn't get to play. You know. Oh, there it is. I got it back. Okay. Oh, well, it's a question. Uh, having worked on both Battlestar series, what, what, what's your opinion on, 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 on robots in our system? Um, well, I, I will say this. I, I think we are moving into the age of miracles, the age of, I'm telling you, the fabric of reality as we know it is shifting and changing as we start to have a window into what the world and the universe really is, what our relationship to it is, and physics, quantum physics, the sciences, you know, are, again, at a very, 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 very fast rate, uh, moving us into a, a world that, that I promise you, none of you know. At once upon a time, you could get a degree, come out, and have a job for the next 40 years. Now, by the time you get the degree, the same way a game company produces a game, that game company has to build into their budget all these course corrections because by the time they finish, if they went down the same course, their game would be antiquated. They have to keep making course corrections in order for that game to come out and be on kind of edge game. So it's like the downloads on your phone. We're going to have to be educating ourselves. And if I was going to college, I'd be planning for 10 years down the road. Not, not one year, two years down the road, 10 years down the road, to know where the job market's going, the job skill sets that are required, and make sure I'm training for the future. Because the future is right here. And it's changing so fast. It could be the most exciting, successful time in the world for people. And yet, it could be terrifying for you if you're not willing to jump into the game. Like I said, one of my problems is people need to go back and be educated. Not be on welfare systems, and not be getting uh, checks. Uh, I, I, I would be going, either get out and do work, help the planet, build roads, do whatever, right? But don't sit home feeling horrible about yourself, which you do. Or you can go back to school. And then we will pay for that to a certain amount of time to go back, re-educate, and then get back into the marketplace. Right? But again, we're not doing it. So, yeah. Steve Hawk and Elon Musk have been doing a lot of what they're talking about. Artificial intelligence and warning is the end of civilization. Yeah, I don't, look at, I don't look at it as the end. I'll tell you why. I believe more in humanity than maybe the future prophets do. And I believe that we are going to build a very synergistic, collaborative relationship ultimately with technology. The technology is coming from us to serve us, not disserve us. It won't have the power over us, uh, but we will go through some bumps and falls and course corrections. Uh, there's a tendency right now with all your apps and all your technology that you don't do any thinking anymore. You don't even think about where you're going to go from destination A to B. You just plug it in and it gives you all the information. So we're not using our brains in the same way. But this is only a kind of an inroad, middle road, where we're going to take all this energy that used to go into these kinds of activities, and then we're going to plug them in to other areas of knowledge, knowing the universe, using ourselves in whole different ways. Because I think the human creature needs to be stimulated. So if we're not being stimulated by challenges, we're going to seek it out in other ways. So I just think this is kind of a temporary kind of lapse, and it may appear to be going in one direction, but ultimately, I think that we will build this very synergistic, collaborative, very positive relationship with technology, and it won't end up being what we see in Terminator, what we see in Battlestar, what we see in all these movies. People always think doomsday stuff. I believe in humanity. We are going to survive, and we are going to surmount our challenges, and we are going to move to a greater day. That's my opinion. So say we all. So say we all.